in the darkness you see Well, there's a So we continue through this series that carries us through many of Jesus's parables. There are teachings, there are stories that he, that he gave as a lesson. And there's many in the, in the Bible, but this one, this one's different. Here's why. I, I remember a conversation that I had with a youth one time. And they said, you know what? This one scares me. I don't understand it. In fact, it makes me think that I don't have a place in heaven. And I'm like, wow, how come? Well, because I just, a few weeks ago, I, I, I took an invitation to go to the altar to receive Christ. And this parable, this parable says that those who receive the invitation, they don't have a spot at the great banquet. And I said, wow. I said, you know what? We need to work through this together because that's not at all true. And I said, I think we can probably do this, but we're going to do this differently. We're not going to run through it beginning to end. We're going to run through it backwards. And they're like, what? You can't read scripture backwards. You can't take a word away. You can't add a word to it. And you can't do it backwards. And I'm like, just wait. Because there's a lot of things in life that I think if we do backwards, they become pretty positive. I mean, there's, there's the joke about country music, right? If you play the country music backwards, it becomes a happy song. Because the first time around, what happens? The guy loses his job, and then he loses his truck, and he loses his house, and he loses his wife, and the last straw is he loses his dog. But if you play it backwards, he gets his dog back, and he gets his wife back, and his house back, and his truck back. He gets his job back, and it's a happy song when we play it backwards. It's kind of a funny way to do it, but listen to this poem, kind of doing the same thing. I don't have the, the author's name, but I believe it was written by a teen. I am very ugly, so don't try to convince me that I am a very beautiful person. Because at the end of the day, I hate myself in every single way. And I'm not going to lie to myself by saying there is beauty inside of me that matters. So rest assured, I will remind myself that I am a worthless, terrible person, and nothing you say will make me believe I still deserve love. Because no matter what, I am not good enough to be loved, and I am in no position to believe that beauty does exist within me. Because whenever I look in the mirror, I always think, am I as ugly as people say? Can you imagine where the heart of that teen might be? It's pretty dark and glim. But here's the thing about this poem. When you read it backwards, it takes a whole different twist. Am I as ugly as people say? Because whenever I look in the mirror, I always think beauty does exist within me. And I am in no position to believe that I am not good enough to be loved. Because no matter what, I still deserve love. And nothing you say will make me believe that I am a worthless, terrible person. So rest assured, I will remind myself there is beauty inside of me that matters. And I'm not going to lie to myself by saying I hate myself in every single way because at the end of the day, I am a very beautiful person. So don't try to convince me that I'm very ugly. What beauty in those words when there's sadness read the other direction. And so I, I think of that poem, I think of going through things backwards because this is how I had to work through Luke 14. 
the parable of the great banquet. Verses 15 through 24. This is how I had to work through this with this youth. And it was kind of interesting as I did this to see where they were in this place of, of despair because of words and the way it was written. Not that it was written poorly, but the way they understood it. And how their face lit up when I taught it backwards. So let's read it through and then let's look at it backwards. Jesus, let me set a stage here, I'm sorry. Let me set a stage. Jesus is at the house of a, of a very prominent Pharisee. They're having dinner, they're reclined at a table, and they're having discussions. And they've just kind of come out of this discussion a little bit. And, and one of the, the gentlemen says, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. They're talking about the kingdom. And that's what one of the, the men there at the table says. And this is Jesus' reply. It says, Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and, and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who are invited will get a taste of my banquet. And that is what hurt that youth because they misunderstood. They misunderstood this parable. Those that were invited, those that were invited to the banquet, if we understand this, that was Israel. Israel was invited. But they did not receive the invitation. And in fact, the, the invitation was given, it says, from Moses and through the prophets. And Jesus was sent to give an invitation. But he was not received. He was not received by his own. And so what happened? God, who's the the house, the, the, the master in this parable. He sent people out. To who? The Gentiles, to the Samaritans. He sent them out to the whole world. But he didn't give this invitation, not like Israel. This was to be compelled, to be moved in heart, to be swayed in such a way because of what Jesus did versus just saying, hey, or excuse me, what God said to the Israelites that just said, hey, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you that you will be a blessing to the nations. And yet they didn't follow him. They didn't follow God's ways very well. And so they walked away from him several times, those that received the initial invitation. Because when there's a party, at least as Jesus is speaking in this parable, when there's a party, there are two invitations that are sent out. The one that says, hey, there's going to be a party. There's going to be a great banquet. There's going to be a feast. And then there's another one that says, everything is ready. Jesus came and told the Jewish people, everything's ready. And yet they didn't receive him. So he said, go out and tell the Samaritans. That's the you and the me. That's the, the youth that didn't understand. And I said, listen, that wasn't an invitation. That was God compelling your heart. That was the words of people who have spoken life into you, that have told you about Jesus Christ, that have told you who he is and what he did for you. That was your heart being compelled, not an invitation. And sometimes it's just those words that stumble us up. And so once that youth understood that their heart had been compelled, I could then talk to them 
about the assurance of salvation that they had. And he said, well, wait a minute. I've made a lot of excuses in my life. Aren't I still like that person in the parable? Like they made all these excuses. I said, well, let's look at them. Let's take a look at some of these ex excuses because that's kind of, that's what I think is most important in this parable. I mean, what is an excuse? An excuse is really something that we say to justify the ends. It's a means to justify the ends. And usually what do we say? It's a poor excuse. It's a poor excuse instead of a good reason. And that's what these people here in this parable are doing. They're giving really poor excuses. You know, the first one, as we go backwards, is the married couple. I just got married. I can't come to this banquet. I, I just got married. It's not a good excuse. I mean, a whole other message could be done just on that one thing. That Jesus sometimes just comes into our life at the most inconvenient times. And when we try and make it convenient, it doesn't work out well. And sometimes we have to go beyond ourselves, even when it's inconvenient for Jesus. But that's a whole other message. Another one says, hey, I've got these five yoke of, of oxen and, and I've got to go test them out. Stop it. Come on. Seriously? Who here has ever bought a used car? Am I the okay couple of you? And I'm guessing that you probably test drove it before you bought it. Stop it. No one goes and buys five yoke of oxen without ever testing them out to see how they do. Same as you don't test, or excuse me, you don't buy the car without test driving it. Stop it. It's an excuse and it's a poor one. Oh, I bought a field. I bought a field and I got to go see it. Stop it. Who here has ever bought a house? You go and look at the house first. You might even have it inspected, and then you purchase it. Anyone ever see the movie Money Pit? Tom Hanks, a young Tom Hanks. What happens? His wife hangs up a, a little piece of clothing. The shelves fall, fall down. He walks up the stairs. He goes running up the stairs to save his wife. And what happens? The stairs, this grand staircase, it falls down. She turns on the water, and brown water comes out. Stop it. It's a poor excuse to say, oh, I got to go see what I just bought. No, you see it and then you buy it. All of these are poor excuses. You know what Romans 1.20 says? Romans 1.20 talks about excuses. It says that no man has an excuse. It basically, paraphrase, says that since the beginning of time, since the beginning of creation, all of creation screams of his eternal nature and divine power so that all people are without excuse, that all would know the glory of God. And it's just a matter of whether we make an excuse up or not. And if we're making up an excuse, and yet Scripture, the truth, tells us that all men are without or, or have no excuse whatsoever, then it means they're all poor excuses instead of good reasons. So don't believe the lies, because I've heard them. I've heard why people don't receive Christ. I've heard why people don't go to church. I've heard why people deny the truth of the Bible. I've got a short list here, but I will tell you it's all because people are believing the deception, the lies of the deceiver, of the enemy, of Satan. And they start saying them to themselves because excuses, excuses are the opposite of the gospel. The gospel the truth, the good news. And every time someone gives one of these excuses, it's the opposite. It's the opposite of the truth. It's the opposite of the gospel. I'm not rich enough. I've heard that one. I'm not rich enough. You know what? You know what Jesus said? In this parable, in the parable that we went through last week about the wedding banquet, he invited the poor. It wasn't the rich. He invited the poor. 
You don't have to be rich to receive Christ. He invites the poor. He invites the blind. He invites the lame. He invites them all. I'm not poor enough. Oh, I'm not poor enough. Oh, this is true. People have said God's only for the poor people. They have to have hope in something. I've got hope in money. I'm just not poor enough to need hope in anything other than that. What? I'm not poor enough. You know what? Even for the rich. The rich just have to be poor in the right ways. Matthew 5.3 says, Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And that's what we're talking about in this parable. The kingdom of God, the great feast, the great banquet, the kingdom of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. I don't give enough. Oh, I've heard that. I don't give enough. Therefore, I can't come to church. Malachi 3.10. A widow. How about this? We'll start here. A widow. A widow who was poor gave two small coins in Luke while the rich were giving bags of gold and money. Jesus saw all of that. And he told his disciples, this widow who gave those two small coins, she gave more than the rich. Malachi 3.10 says to start giving. Give the whole tithe to the storehouse. And see if I will not pour open a blessing upon you. It's paraphrased. It doesn't matter rich or poor, just start giving. It doesn't matter how much you give. As long as you're starting to give with a generous heart, you'll get there. God will guide you. It's not about giving. I need to clean up my messes. I've heard that one before. I need to clean up my messes. You know what? He's going to clean up your messes for you. Romans 8, 28. When you give your life to Christ, all those messes that you have in life, you know what Romans 8, 28 says? He uses all things together for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Those messes that you have, he's going to use for his glory. He's going to use to strengthen you. He's going to use to build you up. And the best part, he's going to then use those stories to help someone else. As long as you're bold enough, as long as you're courageous enough to open your mouth and speak the glory that God has done in your life, he's going to use that. He's going to use your testimony then to help somebody else to come into the kingdom. It's not a matter of your messes. I need to clean up my act. That sounds a whole lot like the same, the last one. I need to clean up my act. You know what? He'll turn you into a class act. Luke 23 speaks of a thief. He wasn't much of a class act. See, Jesus was being crucified on a cross. And to the right and to the left of him, two other thieves on the crosses. One of them says, you know what? I did wrong. I did wrong. And Jesus, will you just remember me when you come into your kingdom? There was no time for this thief to come down from that cross, let alone he wasn't going to. He was there. He was in his last hours to die. He couldn't do anything to clean up his messes. He wasn't a class act to begin with. But what did Jesus say? Surely you will be with me this day in paradise. He says, you're forgiven. I'm not just going to remember you. You're going to be with me. That made him a class act. All because he called on the name of Christ. And there he entered the kingdom. I'm not strong enough. You don't have to be. You don't have to be. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, insults, in hardships, in persecution, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. These are some of the lies that keep people from Jesus Christ. Can you believe it? They're all excuses. They're all poor excuses 
that they've just got to know the truth of who they are in Jesus Christ. They are victorious in Jesus Christ. When you surrender your life to him, when you give your heart as we sang about, here's my heart, here's my life, when you give it all to him, he'll clean up those messes, he'll make you a class act, and he'll make you victorious because so many people are like, I'm a loser, Jesus wouldn't even want me. And maybe you've even said that to yourself at some point. Who am I? Who am I that Jesus would want me? I'm a loser. No, you're not a loser. You're victorious. You're more than a conqueror, it says in Romans. With Christ Jesus, you can do all things. Nothing is impossible for you. When you fix your eyes on him, when you call upon his name as Savior, when you trust in what he did, And when I explained that to that youth, and I went through this, and I went through all those poor excuses, they started to see it. And what they got to was the beginning of the parable that talks about the banquet and the great feast that Jesus is preparing. Jesus talks about that with his disciples at one point too. Here's the Last Supper. He had gone to prepare and he was in the upper room and he was taking bread and wine and he said, I'm not going to take this again until the kingdom of God. It's found in Luke 22. In fact, I'm going to turn there now for you. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Those words echo so much where this parable started. As they're talking about the great feast in the kingdom of God, Jesus is there preparing, preparing for you. If only you receive him, you then...